Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to discuss a little bit about emerging viruses and talk a little bit about how new viruses come to be and if we should be concerned about them. And I think, you know, right out of the gate, you might be um, thinking that there should be a concern, and I would agree. <laughs> um, it's like I'm always concerned about viruses in general, but the thing is, um, you have to sort of temper your concern with viruses, uh, especially emerging ones with like some knowledge. And I hopefully this video will provide some of that. This is a, uh, I believe a scary uh, electron micrograph of Ebola virus. And again, if you're, you're following the news, you might realize that Ebola virus is emerging as, especially currently, when, when I mean by that, it's 2014 and then even into 2015. It's, it's becoming one of the, the largest ep epidemic um, in terms of Ebola in history. Now, there was a previous uh, uh, showing of Ebola in Central Africa uh, a, about a decade ago, but this one is, is the largest one in history, affecting currently about 6,000 individuals. And so the name of the Ebola virus comes from the Ebola River in, in Central Africa, and that's where that name is coming from. And so as it turns out, just to give a little information about Ebola right at the start of the video, is that it's, it's spread by blood mostly, but it can also be bodily fluids. And so it's blood to blood contact. And so if you're dealing with a patient and they're bleeding in some ways, and then one of the problems is, is that uh, one of the symptoms of it is that you are uh, bleeding. It's sort of a virus that's carried in the blood. And so there's some bleeding issues. You can pick it up from the blood or bodily fluids, meaning like if there's some vomiting, and that's, again, another symptom of the disease, you could pick it up from that. Um, but basically, if you're prote wearing protective gown, if you're wearing goggles and masks, you're not going to be, um, uh, you're going to be protected from this. And I just wanted to emphasize that it's not spread through air, uh, thank goodness, or water or food or casual contact or mosquitoes. And so it has to be blood or bodily fluids. And so it's considered to be extremely infectious, uh, but not so extremely contagious. And let me sort of, if I can tease those apart, it's infectious because even just a small drop of blood or even blood um, or fluids from a, a person who died of Ebola can actually carry a large amount of the virus in the, in the drop of blood. And so it's very, very infectious. And it can even be small, a small drop that can, be, can cause the person uh, to die as a result of that. But it's considered to be moderately contagious because as I mentioned before, it's not carried through the air like perhaps like measles or in, influenza, something like that, which again, thank goodness. Um, some of the symptoms of Ebola are it, at first kind of generic and so therefore they're slightly elusive sometimes to physicians i mean it's a it's it's a fever uh some chills diarrhea headache and then this is again kind of fairly common for for a flu and again vomiting body aches but again when a person is coming from an area for example from west africa or or central africa and they're and they're showing signs of this and they've just traveled from this area, perhaps uh, further investigation is needed for this. And then ultimately uncontrolled uh, bleeding, which is a problem. So this particular video, I want to discuss uh, this principle in particular. Now the emergence of new viral diseases are generally thought to be the, the source of three processes. And one is mutation. Now mutation is a change in the genetic material which then culminates in a change in the protein. And when I say protein, the viral envelope proteins, the glycoproteins, uh, or the capsid can change significantly to a point where our immune system isn't able to defend against it or recognize it. So that's number one, mutations. So in other words, the virus is capable of changing. That's not so good. Also, one of the things of concern is that a virus can spread from one species to another. In other words, a bird could, could have a virus and then a pig can pick that up from the bird and then we could pick it up from a pig. And again, more information about that. So that's concerning. And also 
what is of concern is the dissemination of a viral disease is more plausible these days than in the past, simply because of international travel and the fact that people are more in contact with uh, everyone in the world, whereas in the past, sometimes a viral disease would remain in that small sort of isolated population and it wouldn't really threaten the the global population. But now dissemination is a little bit more uh, common, air travel in particular. And so let's, let's first start off talking about this mutation. So a mutation, again, one of the reasons that sometimes viruses mutate more frequently is that especially RNA viruses such as HIV, which you can see in these blue little dots, which are on the outside of a, a T lymphocyte, they have uh, in, their, in their replication process a, a particular special enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And this enzyme reverse transcriptase, uh, it's an enzyme that copies viral RNA into viral DNA. And it does so uh, not efficiently. And as a result of the inefficiency and the inability for it to proofread mistakes, like uh, point mutations, uh, it's going to result in changes in the protein as a result of it. And sometimes these protein that are embedded in the envelope of the virus are altered such that our immune system isn't able to recognize them. So that's of an advantage to the virus. That's not so good that the viruses are mutating. Now, this is one of the basis reasons why you can keep getting the flu year in and year out because the, vi the flu viruses are, are constantly changing. And so mutations constantly create new viral strains that are significantly different from earlier strains, even so much so that you could be, your, the vaccination that you received for the flu the previous year or the year before isn't effective in the current year. And so we constantly need to, to update our vaccinations and our immune system is constantly never letting itself rest. It constantly has to battle. And so this is really the reason for flu uh, epidemics is, is a mutation in the in the proteins or the DNA resulting in changed protein. Now, I mentioned this, another source of new viral disease is the spread of, from hosts. And so a classic example of that is the H1N1, sometimes known as the swine flu. And this particular virus, we believe occurred in a bird at first, and then it was uh, transferred into a pig and then the pig picked it up from a human. And so you can have these cross sort of species uh, transfers, uh, which you know, we believe that 75% of the, of the dis human diseases, uh, viral diseases originated in other animals. And so this is the source of concern. Uh, and another example of this is this hantavirus that, that killed a, a few dozen individuals in the, in the early 1990s. Now, this particular virus shown here usually affects rodents, like, for example, this deer mice right here. But as it turns out, um, the, it, during this particular year, it was, it was really wet. And as it turns out, the, the food supply was really high and the mice population went really uh, higher than normal. And as it turns out, um, all the sort of feces uh, material and urine kind of like people were inhaling the dust of this from the infected mice and they were actually picking up the virus this way. And so it could spread from one species to another and that's of concern. Again, I mentioned the swine flu coming from pigs and th this was big during 2009 in particular and this is a picture of H1N1 virus. Now, one of the th concerns about this is that if you recall how a virus works, or let me refresh you, if a virus is infecting your cell, what it's doing is taking over your cell and it's, it's replicating its nucleic acid and it's also making proteins. And then it needs to package those proteins inside your cell. If it turns out that a particular cell is being infected by multiple viruses, when those proteins are being assembled into capsids, they might actually carry genetic material from two different types of virus. And so this is known as a recombination of viral genome. And when that buds off, it's basically different. It's altered than it was before. And so it'll have maybe different 
proteins ultimately in the next generation, next generation. So you can have viruses that are changing, not only through mutation, but recom but genetic recombination, which is, <laughs> this is where, where I'm starting to get frightened at this point. <laughs> Sorry about that. And so the, again, the, the viral disease can spread. And, you know, again, I mentioned in the past, it wasn't so easily capable of spre spreading. For example, HIV virus that causes AIDS uh, probably went unnoticed. Uh, well, I, not probably, but it virtually went unnoticed for decades before it spread around the world and started to increase. So we believe it started in, in Africa and then, it, and then it moved on from there. But basically, it's technology and social factors like affordable travel like airplane and blood transfusions um, can spread this. Um, sexual promiscuity um, can, can spread it. Um, the abuse of IV, intravenous or IV drug use. Um, so now it's more of a global sort of surge than it would have been in the past. And so uh, these emerging viruses are, are not necessarily v new, but they're emerging because they're capable of expanding from their original host territory. And so uh, another thing that I want to mention is that you may be aware of the fact, but maybe it's new, that some viruses can actually be the result of causing cancer. This is, this is not necessarily a happy topic, but it was known even a long time ago, 1911, that some viruses can cause cancer in chicken. And so we realized that some viruses can cause animal cancers, if you're aware of this. And so some tumor viruses, like retroviruses and uh, uh, adenoviruses, and again, some herpes virus can actually result in cancer-causing um, origins. And so cells can become cancerous as a result of being infected by this virus. So Epstein-Barr virus uh, that, usually, that causes mononucleosis can cause some types of cancer. Uh, hepatitis B is associated with liver cancer. Uh, HTLV1, uh, human uh, T cell lymphotrophic virus, can cause a type of leukemia. And maybe the most commonly known uh, to, to the population is this papilloma virus. Um, this particular virus is associated with causing cervical cancer. And then it's a close up of the cervix, which is the opening to the uterus. So, you know, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, if we can have a vaccination against this particular virus, maybe that will reduce the incidence of cervical cancer. So I think this is a good way to go. So cervical cancer vaccines, uh, you think, you know, this is like a win situation. But again, there's some controversy just to point this out. Because, you know, abstinence, choosing not to have sexual reproduction, have worked to sort of block this, arguing that, um, if you give someone a vaccination against uh, this virus, it's going to encourage premarital sex. I, I, I'm under the, um, the group that disagrees with that. Uh, it's what it actually does is prevent girls from uh, spreading the, the virus, and it actually reduces the incidence of cancer, cervical cancer. And so, yeah, the virus is a sexually transmitted disease, but it has nothing to do with premarital sex or, uh, or choosing to have sex. But basically, the vaccination is reducing cancer. And so let's talk a little bit about things called viroids and pyrons. These are infectious agents that are not even viruses. They're even more simple than viruses. And let me refresh you. You're like, what, what could be more simple than a virus? A virus, which is basically just a protein with nucleic acid inside, and it's not even considered to be alive. Well, viroids are considered to be naked nucleic acid, like a naked piece of RNA, and a pyron is a protein that is malfunctioning. And so that's even more simple <laughs> than the two together. So these are individual things, and they cause disease. Let's take a look at that. So viroids are smaller, even simpler than viruses. They contain like these tiny pieces of circular RNA and mostly affecting plants in particular, so we don't have to fear them too much. Okay, so when you think of circular DNA, I always think of plasmids, that bacteria have these circular rings of DNA. So there's, there's a few, several hundred nucleotides, not very long, and they don't code 
for proteins, but they replicate using the, the host cell uh, enzymes. And so therefore they're um, infectious. They can reproduce and travel onto other cells. And so they disrupt the metabolism of the plant, perhaps stunt its growth uh, and cause some, some difficulties for the plant. Now, a little bit more common, and you may have heard of this before, is um, uh, diseases of the brain uh, that, that were found in sheep and something more commonly known as mad cow disease or in, in humans, I, I'm going to probably butcher this, but Kreutzfeldt or Kreutzfeldt Jacob, Kreutzfeldt Jacob or Jacob, um, this is a disease in the brain caused by pyrons, which are these infectious proteins. So I put a little humor in here because it's getting really intense here. Like, hey, Morty, I heard that, you, you know, have you heard about mad cow's disease? And, and this cow's like, yeah, good thing I'm a helicopter. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So mad cow disease. And so pyrons. So one of the leading hypotheses for this is that a normal protein, let's just say very simple. Here's the tertiary structure of the protein. It can become misshapen. So this is a... An, a misshapen protein called a pyron, and what's particularly insidious about it is that look what it's doing. It's it's not only misshapen, but it's causing other normal protein proteins to become pyrons. So it's sort of a positive feedback kind of a thing. So this guy causes this guy to become a pyron, and next thing you know, the concentration of pyrons are increasing, which then can affect. Um, the normal functioning of the brain if, an, if a number of these proteins become infected. So what's a problem about pyrons is they can con convert normal proteins into pyrons, therefore creating a chain reaction, increasing their numbers. So it's particularly dangerous. Well, a shout out to um, one of the great scientists of our day, and I might even add a, a, uh, a friend. Uh, in 1982, Stanley Poisner uh, published this article about a brain disease in sheep that was related to the Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease, which argued that it wasn't an infectious agent like a virus, but rather a pyron, a protein that caused other proteins to malfunction. It's a picture of him in the lab, Stan in the lab, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1997 uh, in physiology and medicine for this discovery. And so, kudos to to a good friend. And so. You know, where do these viruses come from, just to sort of conclude this, this video? You know, they may have evolved from, um, you know, mo genetic mobile elements. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. But they're, some, they're, they're kind of viruses are always in this semantic fog between, you know, are they alive? Are they not alive? Or, you know, where'd they come from? What's going on? So they're, they're biologically inert. But yet, you know, you can't argue that the fact that the genetic programming, the genes, are uh, similar to the host cells nucleic acids and so you got to wonder about these things and so what I want to say is that though they're oblig uh, obligate intercellular parasites so in other words they can't reproduce on their own they need nucleotides and amino acids and polym polymerases from the host cell it's hard to deny that there's an evolutionary connection to the living world and I want to emphasize that now what do I mean by that because they depend on cells for their own propagation or, or reproduction, it's very reasonable to assume that they evolved after the cell. Okay, So if they need a cell to reproduce, they must have evolved after the cell. So where do they come from? So we believe that there are these sort of nu cellular nucleic acids you know, can move around. And so what we believe, they, they may have originated uh, from the cells being passed from cell to cell via an injury. So nucleic acids move from cell to cell when the cell, cell is damaged. And then perhaps the evolution of the protein capsid uh, just assists and facilitates infection better, especially undamaged cells, because it can migrate uh, and attach to cells, especially envelope uh, viruses can transfer better. So basically, I almost think of a virus as you know, mini organism. It's like nucleic acids surrounded by protein. That's kind of what we are on the most fundamental level. If you read Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, he might, you might agree with that. 
So what are the, some candidates for, the, for these viral genomes? I mentioned this before. Bacteria have these circular rings of nucleic acids called plasmids, and so perhaps the plasmid, which is capable of moving from bacteria to bacteria via pili or tran uh, transformation, maybe this, and yeast even have these plasmids, maybe these are the origin of viruses, or maybe even transposons, which are uh, movable elements in, uh, in eukaryotic cells that, that can sometimes known as jumping genes that can move from one area to another. Maybe these are the source of uh, nucleic material found in viruses because both plasmids and transposons are, movable, are mobile genetic elements. Nevertheless, this is um, you know, my story on emerging viral diseases and I hope you learned something and enjoyed that. Thanks for watching.